Understanding Women Part 4 Published on November 21, 2011, by Carl Donk This is the fourth part of my article on Understanding Women. If you haven't yet read the previous parts, I recommend reading them first so that you can better understand the rest of this fourth part. A lot of what we've been taught about the world we live in is simply wrong. Not only is it wrong, but in many cases we've been taught to believe the exact opposite of the truth. If you've read the previous three parts of this article, you already have a good idea about why we've been taught these things. Back in 2006 I wrote the following. Quote, the world as we know it today is largely based on deception. Incredible amounts of deception going back even thousands of years. A lot of what I learned in school, for example, was just based on lies. The feeling you get when you start to realize what's going on is like going crazy, but in reverse. You realize that you've really been crazy all your life, believing and accepting all kinds of nonsense as normal, and that now you're realizing what's been going on, and are becoming a sane person, seeing things as they really are. It's like growing up with everyone telling you the sky is red, and later finding out the sky is actually blue. Once you find out, you have no choice but to reevaluate everything you know and view them in a totally new perspective. It's almost like forgetting everything you know and starting from scratch again. End quote. But reevaluating everything you know and taking action based on that isn't something everyone can do. It requires a lot of courage. Quite often people are so dependent on the way things are right now that they will refuse to accept anything else if it means they'll have to change their lives or lose the things they depend on. It's especially difficult when changing yourself means that you'll be swimming upstream in society. In addition, those in control in our society will do everything they can to prevent any change that would be against their interests. After all, as I have shown in the previous parts of this series, they are the ones who benefit from this mess. In the second part of my article on understanding women, I mentioned the following. Quote, Fortunately, it's often easy to detect disinformation because it will usually try to make you believe the exact opposite of the truth. It's like Alice in Wonderland. In fact, that's exactly what Alice in Wonderland is based on. Remember that in the Matrix movies, Neo had to go down the rabbit hole to get to the real world. Right now, we are not in the real world. The real world is the opposite of our understanding of our current world. End quote. And one of the areas where this is especially true is when it comes to our understanding of love and our sexuality. Let me bring the following quote to your attention again. Quote. For hundreds and maybe even thousands of years, people have been forced and brainwashed into accepting the opposite in order to frustrate their lives and make it easier for others to control and manipulate them. And this is just one of the areas where this is the case. If you look around you, it should be more than clear that what we've been taught about love and the rules we've been told to live by only serve to frustrate our lives, hurt our relationships, and make things more difficult for us. End quote. In the first and especially the second part of this series, I have shown exactly how we're being manipulated with our sexuality. I've also shown, specifically in the first part, how and why women are the primary victims of this manipulation. In cases where women are unaffected by all the brainwashing for whatever reason, they behave normal as you'd expect. But strangely that's when these women get labeled as being abnormal. An example of this are women, aka nymphos, who suffer from hypersexuality or nymphomania, excessive sexual desire by a female. This is how crazy the world we live in really is, so much so that people who are behaving normal are treated as if they are sick. If you read the description for hypersexuality on Wikipedia, it becomes apparent that essentially most men are suffering from it. Because most men masturbate and think about sex all day long, and are constantly looking for sex. And for men, that is considered normal by society. But strangely, when a woman behaves this way, 
it is wrong and is treated as some kind of disease. This is a prime example of the way in which women have been forced to repress their sexual desires for thousands of years. From Wikipedia Quote Many Victorian-era mental institutions treated nymphomania as an exclusively female mental illness. Women were classified as mentally ill for nymphomania if they were a victim of sexual assault, bore illegitimate children, abused themselves, i.e. masturbated, or were deemed promiscuous. Upon arrival at the asylum, doctors would give the woman a pelvic exam. If doctors felt that the woman had an enlarged clitoris, she would undergo treatments. These treatments included induced vomiting, bloodletting, leeches, restricted diet, douches to the head or breasts, and, at times, clitoridectomies. End quote. While those women were behaving according to their true nature trying to satisfy their sexual desires, just like men do, they were treated as victims of a made-up disease. The only option these women had was to conform to the rules of society and repress their sexual desires, which led to all kinds of mental and health problems which I have discussed in the first part of this series. And not to mention the bigger issues this causes in society and which Dr. Freud warned us about. Just go back and read about female hysteria and vaginal massages. Even then it was clear to doctors what the real issue was, but they choose to benefit from it financially instead of doing the right thing. In addition, those in control who put this system of manipulation into place would never allow the truth to become known. Doctors who would mention the truth would risk losing business and maybe even their license. This happens even today, for example with the HIV AIDS fraud. If you want to know what I'm talking about click here. This is how crazy the world we live in really is. And this is what I meant when I said that we're conditioned to believe the opposite of the truth in order to frustrate our lives and make it easier to manipulate us. We grow up feeling that something is seriously wrong with the world that we live in. It's largely due to big conflicts between what we are taught to believe about life and what we feel is right according to our true nature. Things don't make sense, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what's wrong until we start to do enough digging and find out that we've been living in Wonderland all this time. A world where nothing is what it seems and where everything is upside down, inside out, and the opposite of what it is supposed to be. What is clear to me, and what I want to really stress, is that it's really the women who behave like nymphos who are the normal women. In the beginning of this series I mentioned the following. Quote, there was a time when women thought pretty much the same way about sex as men. During that time women had, and still have, although it is suppressed, a comparable sex drive to men, and they were after sex as much as men, if not more. Sexual desire is something we all get born with naturally. It would have made no sense for nature to put a greater need or desire for sex in men compared to women. In fact, if I look at how women are naturally capable of having sex a lot more often than men, they don't get exhausted as quickly and are able to have multiple orgasms in a very short amount of time, then I would have expected nature to have given women a greater sex drive than men. It would have made sense, seeing as how they are biologically capable of having it more often than men. End quote. Now, you may say that many studies that have been done recently show that men have a greater sex drive than women. For example, in a talk by Professor Roy F. Baumeister, he says, Quote, Look at research on the sex drive, men and women may have about equal ability in sex, whatever that means, but there are big differences as to motivation. Which gender thinks about sex all the time, wants it more often, wants more different partners, risks more for sex, masturbates more, leaps at every opportunity, and so on. Our survey of published research found that pretty much every measure, and every study showed higher sex drive in men. It's official, men are hornier than women. This is a difference in motivation. End quote. And this is true. But would this still be true today if the system of brainwash and sexual repression that targets women 
had not been in place for thousands of years now. I think you know the answer to that question yourself. As I have discussed in the first part of this series, society still forces and brainwashes women into repressing their sexual desires leading to all kinds of psychological issues, which makes women difficult to understand and difficult to live with. If you put a system into place that makes women repress their sexual desires for thousands of years, then of course, if you're going to do a survey today you'll find that women have less sexual desire than men. Any survey about sex drive done today is essentially flawed because it doesn't take this female sexual repression that is built into society into account. It has had a lot of impact on women. It's like teaching kids in school that 1 plus 1 equals 3, and then a survey finding out 30 years later that most people think that 1 plus 1 equals 3. Baumeister also mentions that men and women have about equal ability in sex, but that there's a difference in motivation. This isn't entirely true, as women are physically more capable of having sex than men. And as I said at the very beginning of this series of articles, it would have made absolutely no sense for nature to give women less sexual desire compared to men, while at the same time making them physically more capable of having it. Especially not when you consider that the survival of our species essentially depends on the women since they are the only ones capable of bearing children. So making them less motivated to have sex doesn't make sense. What does make sense is nature giving them an equal or greater sex drive compared to men, similar to how nature made them capable of having sex a lot more often than men, for good reasons. And when we look at nymphos, or in other words normal women, then that's exactly what we see. If you want an example of how women can be normal, behaving just like men with regard to their sexuality, just read up about the women in Iceland. Check out this article on women in Iceland and check out the video below. Iceland seems to have been mostly isolated from the world and they've developed their own culture where you can essentially speak of gender equality. I think in a normal world, the relationship between men and women and the way women behave would be much like the way it is in Iceland, but even better, it's still far from perfect. They don't have the kind of rules and brainwashing in society about love and sexuality that exists in the rest of the world. There aren't any stupid dating games and rituals. Women don't have the kind of unrealistic romantic fairy tale expectations that put a huge burden on them finding a partner. In Iceland, women behave very normal and realistic with regard to their sexuality, and are even the ones who approach guys and take them home at the end of the night. And when reading and viewing the information I just linked to, keep in mind that these women would be labeled as nymphos, whores, sluts, etc. in other parts of the world where there's a lot of female sexual repression in society. It's no surprise to me when reading people's comments that apparently Iceland is a very beautiful country and society to live in. Professor Baumeister also mentions the following. Quote, I have not exhausted all the ways that culture exploits men. Certainly there are others. The male sex drive can be harnessed to motivate all sorts of behaviors and put to work in a kind of economic marketplace in which men give women other resources, love, money, commitment, in exchange for sex. End quote. This is essentially what I've also shown in the previous parts of this series, and I believe that this is the real purpose of all the manipulation that has been going on. All of this is to exploit men and motivate them to work. We're really modern slaves being used by those who are in control. One of their attack vectors has been our women. I've written about this in more detail in the third part of this series, and in the second part, We've seen how our sexual energy is being harnessed when I discussed the documentary, The Century of the Self, and Dr. Freud's theories. Remember how I discussed the movie, The Never Ending Story, where the hero, Atreyu, had to go through so much unnecessary, from his perspective, trouble just to get laid in the end. They've made our women sick, in order to make it difficult for us to satisfy our sexual needs which creates sexual tension. This build-up of energy then gets harnessed to motivate us to behave in a way that benefits those who are in control. 
We're being manipulated into becoming slaves. Or batteries like Morpheus explained to Neo in the movie, The Matrix. Dr. Freud said that the sexual instincts are remarkable for their plasticity, for the facility with which they can change their aim, for the ease with which they can substitute one form of gratification for another. And this is really the basis upon which all the manipulation I have discussed is founded. Dr. Freud is one of the most brilliant men to have lived, and people have just recently started to admit this. Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, used Freud's ideas to create the field of public relations, as we know it today, proving many of Freud's theories about the unconscious in the process. I've discussed some of this in the second part of this series. Bernays essentially showed everyone that his uncle's theories could be used to understand how to control and manipulate people by tapping into their unconscious desires. But looking at it in a positive way, Freud made some brilliant and groundbreaking discoveries that can today help us understand a lot of what's going on in the world. It's important to realize, however, that although Freud may have discovered this knowledge by himself in the 20th century, this knowledge had to be known by others, mostly secret societies, for hundreds and even thousands of years. Not only that, but Freud may have discovered just a fraction of this knowledge. A lot of what we think we're discovering today, and what we think is new to us, isn't new at all. But this is a different subject. Understanding women is something that also kept Freud busy as evidenced by this quote. Quote, The great question that has never been answered, and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? End quote. I'm confident that if Freud had lived longer, he would eventually have been able to answer that question. But I think that with this series of articles I've been able to answer that question, mostly based on, and especially due to Freud's groundbreaking work. Thank you for listening. This article was originally published on Carl Donk's blog at blog.carldonk.com. Remember to visit for regular updates. You can also find this content published on archive.org and lbry.tv. Remember to save a local copy of this video and any other content that you would like to continue to have access to in the future. You never know, those goddamn motherfuckers in big tech might censor this content in the future.